Hey there everyone, it's Juan Romero here from Switch Watch, back with another review. Today it's Salt and Sanctuary, but this was reviewed by Lachlan over at switchwatch.co.uk. However, I thought it'd be a great idea after he'd spent 70 plus hours on the game and even longer putting the review together to turn this into a video review. So I hope you guys enjoy it, but I've just helped edit it together. Thank you Lachlan for doing this for us, really appreciate it. And I hope you guys ultimately enjoy this review. Let's get into it. The story begins with your character on a boat that is attacked by monsters making your way towards the princess that was on the ship. You're confronted by a giant beast that ultimately sinks it. You wash ashore on a mysterious island and it's from this point that you adventure forth hoping to find the princess and rescue her. But this island is of course a very dangerous place. As far as the story goes it's very minimal and aside from the opening moments of the game most of the story beats are told via cryptic conversations with the few NPCs that you meet along the way. Even then, it seems halfway through that the game seems to completely forget the opening moments entirely. Thankfully, the story isn't that important to Salt and Sanctuary. It aims to be nothing more than a reason to move you towards the end of the game. Now let's bring in Lachlan for the gameplay section. Gameplay is where Salt and Sanctuary really shines. The easiest way to describe it would be that the game is essentially a 2D Dark Souls, but it is so much more than that. There is a lot of precise platforming sections that make this feel like a fleshed out 2D platformer, but the action and combat make it more than just a simple platformer. Add in a healthy dose of RPG mechanics, and this is a lot more than simply a 2D Dark Souls knockoff. First off, let's talk about the controls. You begin the game being able to do the simple stuff such as walking, jumping, attacking, you know, the usual. There is also a role which I'll discuss a little later on in the combat section. Later on in the game, you'll unlock new ways to traverse through the world, which are tied to brands that certain NPCs will give you. These brands will allow you to wall jump and add an air dash, among other things. These controls seem simple at first, but when you get into the combat, you begin to see how complex things can get. Combat revolves around reading enemy patterns, picking your moments to strike, and dodging enemy attacks. Every enemy has a range of attacks it can do, each with a unique sign that will allow you to read an enemy's attack patterns and react appropriately. Avoiding an enemy's attacks can be as simple as moving out of their range, or as complex as rolling through it. Rolling itself is a very useful move in combat, as you are invincible throughout the rolling motion. These moments of invincibility allow you to roll through an attack if you time it correctly. You can also roll through enemies which can get you behind your attacker, and this will open them up for a few strikes before they turn around to return fire. As you unlock the new traversal moves, you can also add some unique ways of dodging an enemy's strikes. I found myself during boss battles using the wall jump and air dash together to avoid attacks and jump over a boss as well as get behind them, taking advantage of that opening to get in some quick damage. If I had to sum up the combat as a whole, I would say that it is slow and deliberate. You may have to wait for openings to attack your foes, but doing so is extremely satisfying. Though it can be frustrating at times, you will feel like the deaths you endure were from your own mistakes, and never from the game cheating you. Well, for the most part. There were two moments in the game where it felt extremely cheap and added unnecessary frustration. One area had you fighting invisible enemies which, as you can imagine, feels rather unfair. They are simple enough enemies to dispatch, but being unable to see them? To know where they are, or even read their attack patterns, just feels like terrible game design in a game whose combat is centred around reading your enemy's attacks. The second moment of cheapness comes from the final boss. To enter the final boss chamber, you must drop down off a high ledge, meaning you take fall damage before you even get to fight the boss. This gives you a feeling of being cheated out of some of your health bar, and considering this game punishes you by reducing your maximum health bar every time you take damage, it just feels incredibly cheap. The game is perfect to creating a difficult experience without these tricks, so it is very disappointing that the developers added these unnecessary moments at all. As far as Salt and Sanctuary's platforming is concerned, it is top notch. Controlling your character's movements is very responsive, allowing you enough in-air control to make all the jumps you need to. There are some jumps that require level precision, such as jumping right at the end of a platform, but these harder to make jumps are generally relegated to secret areas that hide some hidden treasures. If you aren't that great at platforming, the game does give you a helping hand. There is a rather generous ledge grab which will allow you to pull yourself onto a platform if you fall a little short. Getting access to the air dash also helps a lot with any platforming woes you may have. In general, the layout of each area is done in such a way that traversing through the world is fun rather than frustratingly difficult. They leave that up to the enemies. There is a rather robust levelling system to be found in Salt and Sanctuary, allowing a high level of customization. Killing enemies gives you salt which you can then cash in at a shrine to level up your character. When you level up, you gain a point for each level you go up, which can then be used on a massive skill tree. This skill tree is where you can really flesh out your playstyle. If you want to be an archer, you can start adding skills that lead towards the abilities which allow you to wield higher level bows. Want to use magic? 
then start adding skills that lead to you being able to cast more potent spells. Beyond being able to wield stronger weapons and magical abilities, you can also increase your base stats such as strength, stamina, dexterity, etc. These stats help determine the strength of your weapons. Just say you want to use a whip, then it is recommended that you level up the dexterity as it is a dexterity based weapon. Want to get stronger with two handed weapons? Then start leveling up your strength. You can also increase how much weight you are able to carry. Don't worry, this isn't an over encumbrance issue like with the Elder Scrolls. The weight system works much the same as in Dark Souls. You have a maximum weight you can equip before you can barely move. The less you weigh, the quicker you move, and the better you roll. Besides your own character, you can also level up your weapons and armor, and the results of it are quite obvious. The more you level up your weapon, the higher your damage output will be. As for armor, the higher its level grows, then the higher your defense gets. The further you get into your journey, you can begin to transmute weapons and armor, which allows you to essentially exchange what you transmute into something more powerful. For example, I exchanged my scythe for a much more powerful one. Transmuting a weapon does lower its level by one though, so my level 6 war scythe was exchanged for another scythe at level 5. I touched on how salt is used to level up, but that is just scratching the surface of what the salt system is in this game. Salt is almost identical to how souls work in the Dark Souls series. Killing enemies nets you salt, which is used as a way to level up not just the player level, but also your weapon and armor level, along with being used as a currency with specific vendors. You do get money, but that is mainly used to buy items, with salt being the main currency for upgrades. Speaking of vendors, you find most shops at the many sanctuaries scattered throughout the world. The shops and their vendors generally aren't just there and ready for you. Many sanctuaries are empty with you claiming it for the faith you have chosen to follow. If you want to then add vendors to your sanctuary, you have to make an offering of a small idol. There are eight different idols you can find, and each one brings with it a specific shop. Each sanctuary can only have four idols offered to it, so choose which idols you offer wisely. Shops aren't the only thing idols give you. Idols also give you an upgrade for the area the sanctuary is located. Some idols grant you more gold or salt per enemy kill, increase item drop rates, or even increase your attack damage and blocking efficiency. This can make you think twice about using certain idols in the starting areas as you may want as much extra damage as you could get for a late game area. Sanctuaries are more than just a shop hub though. The sanctuaries are where the game auto saves, allowing you to finally turn the game off when you need to. It is also where you level up your character, heal yourself back to full health and replenish your health potions. Praying at a shrine isn't all good though as doing so will also revive all the enemies you have defeated, excluding bosses, and, inexplicably, one early area knight. Taking damage in Sultan Sanctuary does not incur quite a steep penalty over time. Besides the obvious downfall of having less health, your maximum health also takes a hit. This means that when you drink a health potion after taking damage, you will have a lower max health stat than when you initially left a Sanctuary. Your overall stamina can take a hit too, especially if you are a spell user. Stamina is used as a pseudo mana bar, so the more spells you use, the lower it gets. The problem is, to prevent you from spamming spells, it actually lowers your overall stamina bar, rather than just taking stamina out of your pool so that you can replenish. This means that if you use too many spells, you'll no longer be able to roll, limiting your ability to dodge enemy attacks. Because of this, I tended to steer clear of spells, so I cannot confirm if using staves, wands, or leveling towards a magic user would lessen the stamina drain effects overall. After finishing the game, you can begin again with a new game plus mode. There is one thing I found to be rather strange whilst playing the game. The in-game play timer is completely busted if you ever use sleep mode. When you put your switch to sleep, it does indeed pause the game, which is the only way you can pause the game, but the in-game timer keeps ticking along. This means that if you want an accurate measure of your overall playtime, then you'll have to make sure to quit the game rather than put it to sleep. It is a minor issue, but one that some of you may be concerned with. Music is used sparingly in Sultan Sanctuary. For the most part, adventuring through the world is completely void of music, leaving you with nothing but the groans and shrieks of enemy monsters, the clashing and slashing of weapons, and the sounds of tearing flesh and blood pouring upon the floor. The sounds are scary, disgusting, and creates a sense of tension and anxiety that few other games can truly capture. When the music does kick in, it is usually to highlight a fearsome boss creature, you will hear a quiet and intense synth that is both beautiful and frightening. Because music is used so sparingly, having the music start belting out through your speakers or headset in these boss battles adds a level of intensity and purpose to the fight. The other moments you will hear music is when you are revisiting an area you have already completed. 
There is more of a triumphant air to the track used in these moments and it all helps to add some fun to slaying the now easy to kill beasts of these early parts of the game. The visuals here are hauntingly stunning. Artistically speaking, the style used here is somewhat cartoonish, but by no means do I mean that in a derogatory way. Characters have a drawn look about them, mirroring what you would expect from an adult style cartoon animation. Enemies are still fearsome to behold, and each character has an underlying menace to them, which I feel means they have succeeded in creating a distinctive style. Colours are dark and muted, often with areas lit by nothing but the flames of the torch. There is a lot of fog and shadow used to limit vision in a way that is masterful, and this manages to strike fear into the unknown by showing you as little as possible. When you are outside and you can see the whole screen, what you see before you is beautifully decrepit and gives you the feeling this place is somewhere you do not want to be. Each of the world's areas are distinctive from one another, allowing you to know where in the world you are just by looking at the assets used. Even the underground areas have a different look from each other, which helps with navigating where you need to go. As for the performance, there are unfortunately quite a few issues with this switch port. Although the game runs smoothly for the most part, there are a few areas where the game will stutter and drop frames. It got so bad during one particular boss fight that the game stopped recognising inputs hampering my ability to capitalise on openings. Luckily, it was one of the easier bosses in the game, but a performance issue this bad could prevent someone from progressing, and this boss was only halfway through the game. Also, after defeating the final boss, I marched forth towards the end of the game. As the final cutscene began, it stuttered quite severely until it eventually crashed and sent me back to the Switch home screen. Upon reloading my save, it didn't save my progress after defeating the final boss, forcing me to replay that final battle before I could hit New Game Plus. When the game did let me view the final cutscene, it still stuttered like crazy. Thank you to Lachlan for explaining about audio, visuals and gameplay. In terms of value, the game is $17.99 for our friends in the US and £13.49 here in the UK. Is it worth your money? Of course it is. It's worth every single penny. You can easily dump over 50 hours into this game and even if you play it through just the once, you're going to get a lot of gameplay out of this one. There's definitely motivation to replay it in the game plus mode as well in terms of our verdict this one for us then is certainly a masterpiece we think it's up there with Hollow Knight and Dead Cells and one of the best games on the Nintendo Switch right now with its mix of tight controls, deliberate combat and tough but fair difficulty. The game's sound and art design is something to behold and helps to add to the overall gameplay experience. The only thing that mars this one from getting the perfect score though, a couple of instances of cheap deaths and the performance does have an issue here and there. It's definitely worth your money though and we would recommend this to anybody who's a fan of the Dark Souls series or just likes 2D platformers with a bit of a challenge. A 9.5 then out of 10 and if you enjoyed this review please hit that thumbs up we'd really appreciate that. Leave us a comment down below you've probably been playing this one for a while already and we'd love to get your opinions on this one and lastly if you're a new watcher then hit that subscribe button for many more reviews like this one or gameplay videos. I want to thank Lachlan again for putting this written review together and some of the audio sections. I really appreciate it. And at the end of the day, we just hope that you enjoyed overall review. Thanks again. My name is Juan Romero from Switchwatch. And of course, I'll see you on the next one. Take care.